difficulty. Hallelujah. Uh, but welcome to Good Shepherd Ministries. Amen. We're excited uh, to be with you, and we hope that you are as excited as we are to be with us this morning and get ready to receive the word of the Lord. Get in contact with your family, get in contact with your friends, get in contact with your neighbor, and let them know Good Shepherd Ministries is on, amen, and uh, let them know that there is a word of God for their lives this morning. We want to, uh, this morning, before we say anything else, we want to honor those who have served in the military, the men and the women, and every person, every individual, amen, throughout the history of our country the United States of America, who has served in the military. Amen. And, and how about if we just right there where you're at, amen, you give all them people a, a, a clap offering this morning. Amen. Let it be heard in your home. Let it be heard in your car. Let it be heard at work, wherever you're at this morning. Amen. How about if we honor all of the men and the women who have served, amen, in this country, in the military, for the safety and the benefit of our lives. We all need you keep uh, Brother Sergio Duran in prayer and uh, a broken rib, and uh, he's been diagnosed with covid 19. Amen. So we want to keep them in prayer. Also keep uh, Maria and Joe de Jesus in prayer as they are recovering also from COVID-19. And we also ask that we keep Willie and Kimberly's daughter in prayer as she has been hospitalized uh, at the Hartford Children's Hospital. Amen. And um, uh, they're treating her. Uh, uh, for a very delicate situation that this child is facing. And so we ask that the church, amen, please continue to pray also for Willie and Kimberly's baby, amen, that the Lord may be with her and that the Lord would bring healing to her life. This weekend we're celebrating Memorial Day weekend and we encourage everyone to be safe, amen, to be safe and remember the recommendations uh, from the CD government, state government, amen, uh, honor the recommendations, be safe, amen, sanitize, uh, wear your masks, keep your distance, amen, uh, um, and, and, let's, and let's be safe uh, and considerate towards one another. This is very important. Let's not become insensitive to the reality that we are facing, of course, amen. We choose faith over fear. Faith is also responsible, amen. Faith is not uh, uh, irresponsible. Faith is responsible. Faith is not reckless. Faith is responsible. Amen. And so we thank God for all of the men and all of the women who are honoring God. Amen. By uh, 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 honoring uh, uh, the recommendations, uh, always sanitizing, always wearing your masks, and always. Uh, we are on part three of the message uh, series that we are talking on, on this topic, Essentials for Revival. How many are excited for revival? How many are looking forward to revival? Amen. We are all excited. We are all looking forward to revival and believe that God has something new, something in store for every one of us. We are excited for what he is doing and what he's about to do. Glory to God. So we ask you, Glory to God to uh, 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 stay with us to, uh, next week. We're going to continue with part four, and we finalize this series, this four-part series. Amen. But we are talking on essentials for revival, and before we enter into this word, let's go to God in prayer. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you for your love. We thank you for your mercies. We thank you for your grace. And we pray that as we get ready to speak your word, Lord, that you would invade, that the Holy Spirit would invade our minds and our hearts and bring conviction of the same to our lives. And that we make ourselves, Father God, uh, available and place ourselves at the disposition of your Holy Word. Speak to us, O oh God. We are listening to everything you have to say. In Jesus' name, amen, amen, and amen. We're reading out of Second Chronicles chapter 7. Amen. We're reading uh, 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 out of Second Chronicles, chapter seven. 
Amen. And we're considering verses 13 through 18. We've been uh, considering the, the, uh, this, this context of Scripture, verses 13 through 18. And we want to continue on this word. And our focus is on, uh, uh, and our focus will continue to be on today in verse 14. Verse 14. And just as a, a, a quick rundown, amen, uh, of what we were speaking, you know, from the beginning to now. Uh, remember that we're talking on the word, uh, we're, we're focusing or highlighting the importance of the word essential, which means absolutely necessary, indispensable, fundamental, imperative, needed, or required. Very important things that we understand. We're looking forward to revival. We are in expectancy uh, for a revival. We are looking forward to experiencing God and knowing God, amen, in a greater way, in a more powerful way, in ways that uh, have been unimaginable for our lives, amen. But then God says, well, there's things in, that, that, that we have to put in place, amen. God is all for it. I believe that God has a great plan for his church. I believe that God has a great plan for every single one of us. I believe that God is getting ready to do something great that's going to bless every one of our lives. Glory to God. But then, you know, there are some essential things that we'll see in Scripture, as we've been speaking for the past few weeks, that God desires for us to have in place if we want to truly enjoy and appreciate the things that God has in store for us. We started talking about um, the fact that uh, the, the very first essential is a humility. Uh, 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 God desires that his people would humble themselves. He says, if my people who are called by my name, if they would humble themselves, according to verse 14 of 2 Chronicles chapter 7, if my people who are called by my name would humble themselves. And then last week we were talking about the second essential uh, 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 ingredient, uh, for, for this blessing of preparing ourselves for revival, which is prayer. Prayer, when we talked about prayer and talking about prayer, we're talking about denying ourselves also. Amen? Uh, uh, remember that anytime God requires something of you, it's because there is something opposing that very thing that God is requiring. So the fact that we're looking forward to his revival, we're, 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 we're you know, living and walking in expectancy of a great move of God, it, it, the fact that God is saying if my people would humble themselves is because God sees that one of the things that has opposed the church, amen, and, and has crept in amongst us in many ways is pride, is conceit, is arrogance, amen? Humility overcomes pride. Humility defeats arrogance. Humility, glory to God, hallelujah, uh, uh, overcomes conceit. It's important that we be humble. And then he says, if my people would pray, if my people would pray, and the most basic definition of prayer is talking to God. Amen. And anyone who approaches God, you know, you understand that you have to practice humility. We see that in 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 6 and 7, where it says, Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, so that at the proper time he may exalt you, casting all of your anxieties on him because he cares for you. And we were talking about that when we go to God in prayer, we understand that God can care, God cares for us. God can take care of us better than what we can take care of ourselves. How many say amen to that? God cares for us. Amen. And one of the reasons we don't go to God in prayer. One of the reasons why we don't go to God and share our anxieties and allow him to care for us is because we've become self-sufficient. One of two things, either we've become self-sufficient or we've become self-righteous. And it doesn't only affect us in our relationship with God, but it affects our relationship with others. The Bible teaches that we should love the Lord with all of our hearts, all of our minds, and all of our strength. But that we should love our neighbor even as we love ourselves. Anytime our relationship with God is lacerated, more than likely you're risking a laceration with uh, uh, your relationships with others. And, and, and so prayer is key. Prayer is key, glory to God, to not only our relationship to God, but our relationship to people. Where we understand that we are not self-sufficient, 
But when we act self-sufficient, not only do we hurt our walk, our journey, our relationship with God, but we hurt our relationship with people. And sometimes people that love us, you know, people that care for us, people who are, are not at fault, glory to God, for whatever it is we are facing. Say so we presented, we were talking about presenting two scenarios. The first scenario, we were talking about the attitude of those who fail to pray. And the second scenario, the attitude of those who do pray, but they do it with the wrong motives. Amen? Is it possible to pray to God, but do it with the wrong motives? Absolutely. James even says it in his book. He says, we pray, we pray, we pray. We ask, we ask, and we ask, and we don't receive because we're asking with the wrong attitude. We're asking with the wrong motives. We're asking with the wrong desires. Amen? We're doing it for, for the wrong reasons. We're asking for such things for the wrong reasons. We're approaching God and, and, and asking God for blessings for the wrong reasons. So last week we were talking about the attitude of those who failed to pray. We saw what happened to Peter. Amen? And the rest of the disciples after Jesus had asked them to pray. And the things, the consequences that came as a result of, of failing to pray. And the things that, that took place and how they were responding to the crisis they were facing but not responding in the proper way because they had failed to prepare themselves through prayer. Somebody say prayer. Today I want to talk about the second scenario. The second scenario. The attitude of those who do pray but they do it with the wrong motives. What about the attitude of those who do pray but they do it with the wrong motives. Is it possible to pray unto God, but pray with the wrong motive? Exactly. Of course it is. Luke chapter 18, verses 9 through 14, speaks of a, an interesting story there. And I want to read it to you. Let's begin from verse 9 to 14. Luke chapter 18, verse 9 to 14. Look what he says. Also, Jesus speaking, also he spoke this parable of some who trusted in themselves that they were righteous. You see, when, when we fail to pray, we, we, there, there's two common enemies that show up in our lives. Number one, we assume that we are self-sufficient, that we are enough within ourselves, that we don't need God, that we don't need his help. But then you have those that, you know, and, and that affects our relationship with God. But then you have those that also assume that they are self-righteous. Self-righteous, of course, it affects their relationship with God, but it affects how they treat others. And, and, and look at the story. He also spoke this parable to some who trusted in themselves that they were righteous. Not only do they think that there's nothing wrong with them, but that self-righteousness leads them to mistreat others and think that they are above others. And so God is dealing with this with his people. Look what he says. They think that they're self-righteous, and as a result of them assuming that they're self-righteous, look what they do. They despise others. They despise others. They mistreat others. They humiliate others. They treat others the wrong way. Look what the Bible says, verse 10. Two men went up to the temple to pray. Two men went up to the temple to pray. Two men went to the temple to talk to God. Two men, two men went to the temple to go into the presence of God. One was a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee stood up and he prayed. And he, and he, he prayed to himself and he says, God, I thank you that I am not like this other man or other men, just adulterers or even as this tax collector. Look at the attitude of this man to the temple to pray, who went to the temple to talk to God. Look at his self-righteous attitude. Look at this self-righteous, self-sufficient conduct and mindset and how it affected his approach to God and his relationship unto men. That he would go to the extreme of humiliating his neighbor. Not only those who maybe didn't have a life like he had, but even the person right, the closest people next to you. The closest people to you. The Pharisee, he stood up. 
He, stood, he was so self-righteous, he didn't need to bow down. He didn't need to put his knee on the floor. He had it all together. He was the perfect man. He was the perfect person. He was self-sufficient. He was almighty within himself. He was above everybody. He thought himself to be a God. The Bible says that he prayed to himself. He was talking to God apparently, at least he thought he was, but he was praying to himself. He was praying within himself. He was almost talking to himself because God doesn't receive those type of prayers. Can I get an amen today? And the Pharisee, he stood and he prayed with himself. He prayed with himself and he said, oh God, oh God, I thank you. I mean, praying like this, and you would automatically assume, wow, he's a man of God. You hear somebody praying like this, and you would assume, wow, what a woman of God. What an anointed child of God. Far from it. Far from it. It was an attitude of arrogance. It was an attitude of pride. It was an attitude of conceit. It was an attitude of self-sufficiency. It was an attitude of self-righteousness. And God says, if my people who are called by my name, they will humble Humble yourself. If we want to experience revival, if we want to experience God in a greater way, we learn humble ourselves and understand that who we are is the grace and mercies of God. We are self-sufficient or self-righteous. Look at the attitude of this man. The Pharisee stood up and said to himself, Oh God! You ever see self-righteous folks? All sufficient folks? Oh, God. Huh, they got to act it out. Oh, oh, God. Hallelujah. Oh, God. Oh, glory to God. Oh, God. <laughs> I want to thank you. Oh, God, I want to thank you that I am not like other men. You know, it's sad that self-righteous people would always try to compare themselves to other people. It's sad, it's sad that, other, that, that self-righteous people would look down on others. Uh-huh. They, 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 they develop a spirit of competition. I wish I had a witness here today. They are self-righteous. They know it all. They're better than they got it all together. Uh-huh. They are 100% perfect. They're the right ones. They do everything right. They do nothing wrong. God looks upon them and nobody else because they are it. No. The Bible speaks of two men who went up to pray. And this Pharisee said, oh God, I want to thank you. I want to show my gratitude unto you. Very theological. Uh huh. Very, very appreciative. Nice, eloquent words, nice, eloquent phrases. Only to put the next person down. Oh God, I want to thank you. I want to exalt you. I want to worship you. I want to praise you because I'm not like everybody else. I'm it. You know who, you know who it is, God. You know it's me. You know who, it's me who is here now, God. You know me. You know how I do, Lord. You know me, Lord. You know I ain't like everybody else. I'm not like that bald-headed pastor preaching right now. You know, you know that, right, God? You know I'm above him. I'm better than him. I'm better than that church, oh, God. I can find a better place. I can find a better leader, Lord. I can find a, a better church, Lord, because you know I ain't like that. I wish I had a witness here today. Glory to God. The self-righteous attitude is a diabolical attitude. The self-righteous attitude is an attitude that does attitude. It's a attitude that helps and hurt those around them. And God says, I'm going to deal with that. 
Because people not only should humble themselves, but they need to learn to pray. See, because when we go to God with the right attitude, with the right motives, there's something that happens in us that will change us and transform us and bless us and lead us to treating people with dignity and with respect and not looking down on them. I wish somebody would give the Lord a clap offering this morning. Uh-huh. He stood. And he prayed with himself. Is it possible that people who think they're talking to God are really praying with themselves? You're really talking to yourself because you're really, you know, you're full of self-righteousness right now. You're full of pride right now. You're self-sufficient right now. I know some don't want to hear this, but I got to preach this. Hallelujah. Glory to God. I got to preach this word because God has taken us somewhere. God is leading us somewhere. God wants to do greater things in our lives, but we have to have the essentials in place if we want to experience revival. He wants us to live again. God, I want to thank you that I am not like the other men, the other people, the other folks. I'm not like that other brother. I'm not like that other sister. I'm not like that other person in the church. I'm not like that other individual. Oh, our family ain't like that family. Uh, uh, you know, Lord, our family, you know where we come from, Lord. Our family is not like that family over there. Guys, be careful. Don't get too close. Because, you know, our family ain't like that family. Be careful, guys, not to get too close. You know, God has chosen us. You know, God has anointed us. We are a Levitical family. Uh-huh. We, we are a priestly family. Uh-huh. And, you know, we, we reign. You know we reign, right, guys? You know we reign. We ain't like that. Get off that horse. Tell somebody, get off that horse. Glory to God. God can't stand ugly. And pride is ugly. 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 Sufficiency is ugly. Is ugly. So even in coming, coming to the presence of God, we need to practice humility. Hallelujah. The way you dress don't make you better than the next person. Oh, Pharisees used to dress good. Pharisees, uh, they were Pharisees. You know what I mean? They had some, some high class way of dressing. Oh, glory to God. Uh, I thank God for the folks. Who, who can't spend all the money that some other people could spend. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm glad for the folks who can't shop at, at, at the mall, at, 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 at the expensive stores, or, or they can't shop online. Uh, they, they, they could wear Walmart clothes, glory to God, but, 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 but you know, they got a humble heart. Hallelujah. 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 They're not concerned about their clothes, glory to God. They're concerned about living Lord, a clap offering today. Self-righteousness is a problem. And it's become a problem in the church. Pastors who think they're better than other pastors. Churches who think they're better than other churches. Musicians who think they're better than other musicians. I wish I had a witness. Uh, teachers who think they teach better than the other teacher. I wish I had singers who think that, you know, they're the Levites. They're the ones with the angelic voices. I'm talking about self-righteous people who puff themselves up. That was the attitude of that man. And they speak in the name of God and they pray in the name of God and they talk in the name of God. No, because you don't know, you don't know what God, you know, God told me. Because God said, because God this and God that. And they're using God's name in vain. Because their attitude is an attitude of pride and conceit and self-righteousness. And God does not move in that manner. I thank you, Lord, that I'm not like the other men. Extortioners. Unjust. Adulterers. Or even as this tax collector. 
I'm glad I'm not like them. Look at the prayer of this man. Look at this insulting prayer. Look at this, this reckless prayer. Look at this prayer. Praying unto God and putting down and humiliating the very thing that Jesus Christ came to die for, people. And Jesus says, I didn't come for those who are well. I didn't come for the righteous. I came for the sick. I'm here to tell you that if you are sick, it doesn't matter what your condition is. It doesn't matter what your sin has been. It doesn't matter what your life has been. It doesn't matter what pit you have fallen into. I'm here to tell you that God's love is unconditional. I'm here to tell you that the blood of Jesus cleanses all sin. I'm here to tell you that Jesus left heaven, came down and became a man, went to the cross and resurrected and is a hand at the right hand of the Father just for you, just for you, for you. Hallelujah. It doesn't matter what people say. It doesn't matter how people put you down. It doesn't matter how you're despised, rejected, mistreated, and overlooked. Jesus loves you just as you are. Even, with self, even when self-righteous, holier-than-thou people would choose to put you down and reject you. I'm here to tell you, Jesus loves you. Somebody give the Lord a clap offering. Look what he says. He says, I'm not like these men. I'm not like the extortioners. I'm not like the thieves. I'm not like the robbers. I'm not like the unjust, the unrighteous. <laughs> I'm not like the, the sinners. I'm not like the adulterers. And I'm not saying that none of this is right, but man, just because I've been washed by the blood of the lamb, it does not give me the right to put the next person down. Just because I've been redeemed does not give me the right to put the next person down. Just because God has changed my life does not mean uh, that the person who still needs to get worked on, God, I need to humiliate. Uh-uh. God don't work like that. Hallelujah. God, God does not make exceptions of people. God loves me and he loves the sinner. As a matter of fact, we are still sinners. We are forgiven sinners. We are redeemed sinners. Because even as believers, we fail. Look at this man. God, I thank you. I'm not like them. Extortioners and sinners, adulterers, immoral people. Oh, and even this guy at the altar with me. <laughs> and even this girl, this little sister who's also a member of our church. And what about her, Lord? Look at her. Look at her. Yeah. Look at you. Huh? How about if we turn our eyes on you and we talk about the way you talk and you put people down and you talk self-righteously and you puff yourself up. And you think you're better than anybody else. How about if a God turns his eyes on you and pulls your rags out? Because maybe the difference between her sins or his sins, the difference between their sins and yours is that theirs are visible and yours are not. <laughs> Hello, somebody. Maybe theirs are visible because what they do, they've done it public, but maybe what you've done is, is in hiding, is in the dark. I wish I had a witness here today. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Uh, who we are and what we have is by the grace of God, is by the mercies of God. Self-righteous people always look for ways to talk about and humiliate others and put them down. How can we find satisfaction putting other people down? What satisfaction is there in talking bad about the person who failed or the person who don't have it right or the person who keeps on falling into the same pit? I don't find satisfaction in that. There's no fun in that. 
After all, that's not the mission of Jesus Christ. How many times did Peter fail? How many times did other disciples fail? And Jesus didn't disqualify them. He worked with them. He didn't reject them. He loved Judas to the end. And even on the moment that Judas betrayed him, he called him a friend. And of course, Judas did what he did, unfortunately. But even when Peter failed, even when Peter failed, like we spoke last week, Jesus found him at the seashore and says, Peter, do you love me? Peter, do you love me? Peter, do you love me? Oh, hallelujah. Uh, you know, maybe you love God and you're still struggling. I'm, I'm, I'm here to tell you that, uh, that, that, that there is hope for you. Maybe you love God, uh, but you keep slipping. I'm here to tell you that there's hope for you. Maybe you love God and you keep failing. Uh, I'm here to tell you that there's hope for you. Maybe you love God and you keep messing up. I'm here to tell you that Jesus loves you for who you are and not what you've done. But people have been feeling condemned because of the self-righteous folks right inside the church. I'm not like this man. I'm not like the extortioner. I'm not like the sinner. I'm not like the robber. I'm not like the adulterers. It's me. It's me, the preacher. It's me, the minister. It's me, the leader in the church. It's me, the deacon. It's me, the church board member. None of those titles fit well when we become self-sufficient and self-righteous. None of those titles fit well. We dishonor God. We insult God and his character. When we are willing to call ourselves pastors and preachers and ministers and the anointed ones of God and, and the singers and the musicians and the deacons and whatever leadership position you hold. But we mistreat others in the church or mistreat those that need God. Because now we thought that we've reached a level of, 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 of righteousness in our relationship with God that we think we have the license, the right to put others down. God help us. God help us. Lord have mercy on us. I'm not like this tax collector. I'm not like this crooked man. Oh God. Look what he says, verse 12. I fast twice a week. This man fasted more than just some of you guys fast. <laughs> he fasts twice a week. He gave tithings of all that he possessed. I'm not like this man. I'm not like the sinners. I'm not like the unrighteous. I'm not like the tax collector. As a matter of fact, I pray and fast twice a week. And I am a faithful tither. I'm better than all of these. It's me, Lord. And I thank you, oh God. Look at the attitude of this man. And yet, look at the attitude of the tax collector. The Bible says, in the tax collector, standing afar off. What does that mean? He felt unworthy. See, when you know that you are in the hands of God, when you know that you serve a merciful God, when you know that you serve a compassionate God, when you know that you serve a forgiving God, uh, oh, glory to God, there's no room for self-righteousness. There's no room for self-sufficiency. You feel unworthy. Oh, God, I'm not even worthy to approach your throne. I'm not even worthy to approach the altar. I'm not even worthy to come near you. Oh, God, I'm not worthy. I am a sinner. The Bible says that he would beat himself on the chest. I am a sinner. The difference between humility and pride, self-righteousness, and the righteousness of Jesus Christ. Those who walk into the church with their head up high, putting their chest out, puffing themselves and pumping themselves up 
and looking down on everybody else as they come through the aisles and those that come down with the head hanging looking down because you know you are unworthy of your salvation you know you are unworthy of your redemption you are thankful you are you appreciated hallelujah you are grateful but you understand uh, that you're not worthy glory to god you understand that you're not entitled uh, that's the heart that god is looking for that's what prayer does to us when you go to god in prayer with the right attitude uh, prayer will help you develop humility Prayer will help you go to God with the right attitude. Prayer, prayer will help you, the right prayer, with the, the right attitude, with the right mindset, will help you get rid of the self-sufficiency that exists in so many lives, the self-righteousness that exists in so many lives. And Jesus says, I tell you the truth. This man, this tax collector, went to his house justified rather than the Pharisee. Oh God. Oh. Because everyone who exalts himself will be humbled. But he who humbles himself will be exalted. Church, I got to tell you this quickly, glory to God. You see, if we want to experience revival, we must engage in honest and humble prayer. And if we're going to pray, we must pray with the right motives because God wants to bring the tax collectors to church. God wants to bring the prostitutes to church. God wants to bring uh, the drug addicts to church. God wants to bring uh, the alcoholics to church. Uh, God wants to bring uh, the homeless to the church. God wants to bring the extortionists to the church. God wants to bring uh, the sinners to the church. God wants to bring uh, the immoral and the adulterous to the church uh, but church can't look uh, the way it was looking before this crisis church has to have uh, a new normal it has to be full of love uh, it has to be full of compassion it has to be full of mercy we need to be a reflection of Jesus Christ and if the if the world is going to come if the sin is going to come Jesus said come as you are you don't have the power. I don't have the power to change them. But when they come to the Lord, the Holy Spirit knows what he has to do in their lives. We need to stop being Pharisees. Not only do we kill the sinner, reject the sinner, humiliate the sinner, but we mistreat each other. Brother against brother in the church. Sister against sister in the church. Leaders against leaders in the church. People against people in the church. Enough of that. Enough of the Pharisaic attitude. Enough of the Pharisaic heart. Enough of the lying tongue. Enough of, enough of the self-sufficiency and self-righteousness. If my people would humble themselves and pray. Somebody say, enough is enough, enough of the hypocrisy, enough is enough, and we'll enter into the third essential before we close, the third essential, he says, if they would humble themselves, if they would pray, and if they would seek me, there's been a problem with people seeking God. And let me tell you something. When you don't seek God, it's because you're seeking something else. Uh-huh. You see, anytime we fail to seek God with an honest and humble heart, it's because we're struggling with idolatry. When God requires something of you, it's because there's an opposition to the very thing he's asking of you. And, and, and God here is saying, I want you to seek me. Why is God asking his own people to seek him? It's amazing. You would think that common sense would tell you that as children of God, we would automatically seek God, but it's not happening. That's not what's going on. There's idolatry in the church. There's false worship in the church. Many folks in the church are following things, are loving things, are honoring things, are worshiping things, are, are praising and exalting things uh, more than God. 
So God has to shake us. God is not just shaking the world. God is shaking the bride because the bride has to wear white. You can't be the bride of Christ and try to wear a, a red dress or a black dress or a yellow dress or, or a blue dress or a green dress or whatever color it is. The bride wears white. Hallelujah. The bride wears white. And she wears a veil. Why white? Because white is a sign of, 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 of being a virgin, of being pure. Hello. Why the veil? Because I've never given myself to another man but the God that I'm going to give myself to. I've never given myself to another God uh, than the God I'm surrendering to right now. Somebody say it. The bride wears white. We must seek him. We must seek God. Get rid of the idolatry that's going on in the church a whole lot of idolatry in the church. We've become so religious that we could sing the church songs but not worship God. We could sing the songs but love items and articles and statues and images more than what we love God. We love our houses more than what we love God. We love our money more than what we love God. We love, we love people more than what we love God. I wish I had a witness. Glory to God. We love our possessions more than what we love God. And you know what? We've become a Pharisee. Oh, God, I thank you. I thank you, God. No, nah, man, we are idolaters. What's an idolater? What is idolatry? Idolatry is the worship of idols or man-made images, statues, or icons that are thought to embody some sort of false god or false, or, or, or false deity. But it is also defined as pride or self-centeredness or an excessive devotion or reverence or even love of self. This was an insult to God because idolatry meant any time a child of God fell in, into idolatry. It insulted God because it meant that something became a substitute of the place that belonged to God. The place that belonged to God in our, in, in our lives, something has taken its place. We've prioritized other things. And idolatry is, allow me to quickly just mention Two practical forms. I'm going to just limit this to two. Two practical forms of idolatry that we struggle with. Number one, when we worship pagan gods. Your car could become a pagan god. Your money can become a pagan god. Your house can become a pagan god. Your clothes can become a pagan god. Your hairdo can become a pagan god. Uh-huh. Your hairdo. Some people don't worship the Lord or come to the house because I'm having a bad hair day. Look, man, just do something with it. Do pick it up, let it down, or just shave it like I shave my head. But don't stop worshiping the, the one and only true God. Idolatry is demonstrated in two practical ways. That I, well, I, there's many ways, but I just want to mention two. Number one, the worship of pagan gods. Look, you know, people would, 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 would make images or worship images or statues or icons. Lovers of things, lovers of items, idolatry. And none of that's going to help you. None of that's going to bless you. None of that's going to make your life better. I wish I had a witness. Glory to God. I know people who have it all. Good jobs, good money, good career, retirement, vehicles, houses, Great whatever this, great whatever that, and they are miserable. And I know other folks who don't have none of that. And they are the most joyous people, God revering, God, God worshiping, God praising, God exalting, God following people of Jesus Christ. 
And they don't have none of that. They don't have education. They don't know how to read. Hello, somebody. They don't know how to cook, maybe. Maybe, maybe they don't know how to combine their clothes. I, I know you get it right every Sunday. You got the right combination, the right earrings. You got the right necklace. You got the right hair. You know, you just, you just got it right. And then the other brother comes in with chancletas and, and funny-looking pants and a funny-looking T-shirt and a funny-looking hairdo, and we want to criticize them. But they're worshiping the Lord. Uh, they're exalting the Lord. And God is looking upon them and saying, I love that worship. I love that praise that you ain't allowing, hello, your self-righteousness or your self-sufficiency to get in the way. You're not an idolater. You're not worshiping your clothes. Oh, don't, don't touch me because my dress, you know. Don't lay hands on me because I just got my hair done. A whole lot of stuff going on in the church that God's already starting to deal with and we're going to get revival. Remember, revival means to live again. There's a whole bunch of dead folks in the church. A whole bunch of dead bodies in the church. I wish I had a witness here today. But revival's coming. Revival's coming and the doctor's in the house. And the doctor's name is Jesus Christ. His name is Jesus. His name is Jesus. His name is Jesus. Seek him. Somebody say, seek him. Number one, the worship of pagan gods. And look what Psalm 135, chapter 15, uh, uh, Psalms 135, verse 15 through 18 says. It says, the idols of the nations are silver and gold, materialistic things. The work of men's hands. They have mouths, but they don't speak. They have eyes, but they do not see. They have ears, but they do not hear. Nor is there any breath, any life in their, in their mouths. Uh, those who make them are just like them. They're dead. Those who worship them, those who make them, those who adore them are just like them. They're dead. If you worship your car, you are dead spiritually. If you worship money, you are dead spiritually. If you worship your possessions, you are dead spiritually. People who worship pagan gods. I'm not talking about Baal. Or any of the other gods mentioned in scripture. I'm talking about modern day gods. Your sofa, your TV, I wish I had a witness here. Your refrigerator, your furniture, your house, your hardwood floor. Your job, your career. None of that is wicked within itself until you make it a god. Until you make it a god. And when we start worshiping other things, you know what happens? We lie to get them. When you worship benefits, you know what happens? You lie to get that benefit. Somebody lied to get that job. Somebody lied to get that insurance. Somebody lied to get a payment. Somebody lied to get a friend. Somebody is lying. When we worship pagan gods, our lives and our language and our attitude becomes a god or, or, or a lie, I should say. And we're living a lie. Oh, it looks like some people are turning me off already. Some people are turning it off. Uh -uh. Tell your neighbor, don't turn it off. God is talking. We become liars. We got to cheat. We got to practice deceit. To try to get what we want to get. Because we're no longer worshiping. When we lose our worship to God, we lose our reverence. We lose the fear of God. We lose respect for God. We lose honor for God. We're worshiping items. We're worshiping benefits and we become liars. We lie to get those things. But worse than worshiping pagan gods, another practical way that idolatry shows itself is the worship of self. We don't seek God because we're always seeking other things. We worship items. We worship images. We worship icons. But it doesn't stop there. We become worshipers of self 
and we think of ourselves as gods. People in the church who think that they are God. Can I, can I preach this today? I know I'm running out of time and, and David's looking at me with his eyes crossed. Uh, but I got to say this to somebody today. You are not a God. You are just a man. You need God. Look what the Bible says in Ezekiel 28, 2. Chapter 28, verse 2. The Bible says, Son of man, say to the prince of Tyre, thus says the Lord God, because your heart has become proud and you have said to yourself, I am a God and I sit in the seat of the gods, uh, in the heart of the seas, uh, yet you are but a man. You are not a God. Though you make your heart like the heart of a God, you are a man. You're not a God. You ain't better than nobody else. You're not a deity. You don't have a throne. Who are you to put down the next person? Who are you to put down the next individual? Who are you to judge that person? Who are you to condemn that individual? Who are you to hate on people for no reason? Who are you to lie about what you're lying about? Oh, but we're singing... We're singing, me voy con él, me voy con él. We're singing, all oh, revival's coming, the fire of God. Let the fire of God revive you. Let the fire of God purge you. Let the fire of God consume you. Because there's some things that need to die. Pride needs to die. Self-sufficiency needs to die. Arrogance needs to die. Conceit needs to die. Self-righteousness needs to die. Idolatry in your life needs to die. The pagan gods that you've created for yourself, they need to die. And you, you need to die to self. Put that old nature away. Put that old man, that old woman away. And let Christ live in you. Live in you. Paul said, I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. And the life that I live now, I live for the honor and the glory of the God and the Savior who redeemed me. Somebody give the Lord a clap offering today. Let's go to God in prayer. I'm done. I'm done. I'm done. I'm done. I wish I could keep on going. There's so much. Would you pray with me? Would you extend your hands right there? Close your eyes and extend your hands and say, God, help me. God, help me. I need you, God. I need you. Would you do like the tax collector? Would you just, just beat your chest and say, God, I don't deserve you. I don't deserve salvation. I don't deserve redemption. I don't deserve anything. All that I am and all that I have is because of you. Have mercy on me. And will you start loving people? Love them as of now. Appreciate people as of now. Amen. Let's get rid of that self-righteous, self-sufficient spirit. That spirit of idolatry. Where not only our relationship with God is lacerated. But even our relationship with others. Father, in Jesus' name we thank you. For your love and for your mercy and we pray. That this word has touched and brought conviction to every life this morning. And that you would use your servant David preaching in the next hour. We pray, Holy Spirit, that you have your way. And that you lead us into revival. Helping us to put in place those essential things. We pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. June 7th. Sunday, June 7th. Get ready. We're going to be uh, giving out more information. If we don't have your email, if we do not have your email, please text your email to Pastor Anna right now. Text your email to Pastor Anna right now because we're going to be emailing you. Amen. Our, 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 our form of uh, what the new services are going to be looking like for phase one starting on June 7th, Sunday, June 7th, right here at 1 o'clock in the parking lot.
You don't want to miss it. We're going to be outdoors right here on our church property celebrating a dry, our drive-in services every Sunday and practicing social distancing, sanitation, and wearing our masks. Amen. God bless you. God keep you. We love you. Till next time.